So this talk is about uh, React Native, and uh, my goal of this talk is to make you more excited or excited about uh, React Native. And if you are in the position of uh, starting a mobile development, I hope that you will think of React Native as a good approach to, uh, to, to starting with your uh, uh, development. So my name is uh, Truls. I've been using React Native since 2015. I've been part of several teams shipping React Native apps to millions of, of clients. Uh, I've seen the good side of React Native and also the, the bad sides. And uh, recently, it's more of the, the good things than the bad things. And currently, I'm leading the front-end initiative at a company called Kron in, uh, in Norway, where we use React Native and uh, React Native Web. So uh, let's see what's in store for you for the next 40 minutes, if you decide to stay for the whole, <laughs> the whole 40 minutes. I, I hope so. So I'll start with a short history of React Native and show you some, uh, some code of how React Native works, just to make sure that we are, all are aligned what React Native is. Then I'll talk a bit about how it works under the hood. Uh, for the last three years, the React Native team has worked on a new architecture which uh, enables a lot of cool things which the old architecture uh, didn't allow to. So I try to explain the difference and how they have uh, solved it. Uh, I'm gonna uh, try to show some demos, uh, especially animations and 2D graphics to try to debunk the myths that you can't really do uh, animations or complex 2D graphics with uh, React Native. Uh, then I'll talk a bit about how you can integrate uh, React Native with already uh, existing native code on Android and iOS. And I'll end the talk with, uh, with how we use React Native Web at uh, Kron and what that uh, really means. So let's start with a short, short history. So the story goes that, or at least that in 2015, React Native was launched to the public. It's an open source uh, package that's created by Facebook or Meta. And the problem that they were trying to solve was not to create a cross-platform framework. The problem they were trying to solve was to make it as easy as possible to build beautiful UIs. Because the problem that they saw was that there was a lot of different elements and they didn't know which elements to use, use at any given time. So they wanted to create a small subset of components that they were able to uh, uh, use to build UIs, and then uh, the platform decided how those components were displayed on the screen. So in 2015, first it was launched for iOS, a couple of months later it was launched for Android, but today you can write React Native on iOS, Android, Android TV, Mac OS, TV, OS, web, Windows, and, uh, and VR. And when I go through, through how the new architecture of React Native works, you will see that they have made the core part of React Native platform agnostic, so you can drag and drop it into any platform that basically runs C++, which I think is, is pretty cool. And just to get it out of the way, like React Native <laughs> is native. So all of these components that uh, the React Native team has created, like a view, a text, a button, a list, a text input, all of those are translated to native components on the native side. So a view is a UI view on iOS and an Android view on Android. So uh, I'm gonna try to show you uh, some code now of how uh, it actually works. So let's see here now. So here we have a basic React component for the ones who are familiar with that. And the layout engine in React Native, uh, which is called Yoga, has implemented uh, the Flexbox standard. So we use a subset of Flexbox, so whoever's are familiar with Flexbox uh, can get uh, quite uh, fast up to speed with uh, React Native. So by default in React Native, all views or all components are flex, display flex. So if I do this, you can see that on uh, the iOS uh, simulator here and the Android emulator here that it both uh, updates. And I can also add 
make the code bigger. Okay, thank you. Now I can see. Let's see if I, is this big enough? Okay, thank you. Why didn't, uh, why didn't you tell me that it was so small? <laughs> okay, let's, uh, so since I also have a Norwegian keyboard, I can write the Ö. So you can see here that um, we have uh, the text input shows Ö dev and as on the web, everything is located on the top left corner. So it's also uh, located outside of the, the viewport here actually. So we can use Flexbox to, to center it. And as everyone who's familiar with uh, the web, uh, you are familiar with uh, the hot reloading that you also get out of the box in React Native, so you don't have to, to recompile. And here you can see the first example of that it React Native actually is, is native. You see that on the iOS simulator, the text is black, but on the Android, it's kind of brownish. And that's the default behavior of text on the, the native platform. So I can style it up, give it a color black, and I can increase the font size a bit. So the, the way you write uh, styles in React Native is quite similar to how you do it in, uh, in web. And another example that it's actually native is that you have this uh, indicator of uh, that there is some, some loading happening. And you see that on iOS, it's default. Let's see, I can make this a bit uh, bigger. You see that on iOS and Android, it's different. It's the, the one that uh, is specific for, for the platform. And if you have uh, a button as well, you have the press me, you have, uh, instead of on the web, you have uh, on click, on, an, on React Native, you have on press. And you can, we can show, we can have a callback that uh, shows an alert that gets pressed when when the, when the button gets pressed. So you also see here that uh, by default on iOS, uh, the button is just a text, but on Android it's actually a button, but you can decide the design the buttons however you want, it's just how they work out of the box. And if I press the uh, button on iOS, we get a, a, a native alert dialog on iOS, and on Android, you also get the, the, the native one. So essentially what happens is that all of these components here, they have a corresponding component on the native side, and that's what Yoga does out of the box, the UI render in uh, React. It translates your React code to the corresponding uh, views in, um, on the native side. So that, does, does that make sense? Are we all aligned that React Native is native? Perfect. So let's uh, dig a bit into how React Native actually works. So a couple of months ago, uh, the new architecture for uh, React uh, was launched. And one of the things which is uh, good with React Native and that Meta actually uses React Native in their apps, they really can't have that many breaking changes because there's a lot of teams at Meta that uses React Native. So if they have a lot of breaking changes, all of those teams will have to go around and update their code. So it's, uh, it costs React Native less if they fix all the uh, APIs internally than to have uh, breaking changes. So with um, the, both the old and the new architecture are living side by side now for a while to make sure that everyone updates uh, uh, to the new architecture. But let's start with, uh, with how it works. So the code that I just wrote, the React code, that's here, and then in React Native, th there is something called uh, a metro bundler that uh, compiles the React code to a JavaScript bundle 
just as you create a JavaScript bundle on, on the web. And that lives on the UI tied the JavaScript thread. So if you open your phone and you go to any uh, web page that uh, executes JavaScript, this is the JavaScript thread, is the same thread that executes uh, the web page JavaScript as React Native uh, leverage. And then there is a concept called the bridge, which is a way for the JavaScript to communicate with the UI thread and the native side of the platform. So here we have uh, Yoga, which I talked about, which translates all the UI to its native uh, UI and uh, gives it to the native UI, and that's displayed on the screen. And there's a concept called native modules in React Native as well, which is, for instance, the alert box that we saw, or any platform, uh, any native code that you need to run. So, for instance, if it's Bluetooth, if it's camera, and uh, any specific to the platform, that's native modules. So let's uh, go a bit through this and see the limitations of the old architecture. So the first one is the bridge share. There is only one bridge in React Native, and each time you communicate back and forth, it goes over the bridge. So there can be a bottleneck there. I've never uh, experienced it, but I know that, for instance, if you're targeting lower-end Android devices, there might be a bottleneck uh, for the bridge. And with the old architecture, you can think of the JavaScript thread as the front end and the UI thread as the back end. So everything that goes over the bridge has to be serialized. And that means that uh, all the communications back and forth here is asynchronously by default, which means that the JavaScript side uh, doesn't know anything about the native side and vice versa. And what's the problem with that? One of the problems is that when you open your React Native app, it has to initialize all your native modules by default. So for instance, let's say that somewhere deep in your app you use uh, a Bluetooth or you use camera or anything. All of those packages has to be initialized on startup because there is no way for React to lazy load these uh, packages. Uh, another problem is that um, with React 18, you have uh, concurrency mode, which basically means that there is a priority queue where React can tell uh, what you should uh, optimize depending on what the user is, is doing. So for instance, if the user are scrolling a list of uh, images, uh, you might would, li you would like to tell the native side to optimize for the scrolling of that list and not anything else. But since the bridge is asynchronously, there is no way to implement a priority queue. And also the Yoga, the UI uh, engine, is also written in each platform, which means that even though it has the same specs, it works differently on each platform. So you, uh, every now and then, there are some differences on how it's been implemented. And for instance, there's been done some uh, optimization on Android and some optimization of the Yoga render on iOS, and those are not shared across the platform because it's implemented on each platform. So did that make sense? Amazing. You're a good, uh, good crowd, or just uh, polite, I don't know. So this is the new architecture. So there's a lot of uh, the same concept here. You have React, you have the Metro Bundler, and you have uh, the JavaScript Bundle. But here's three new concepts. You have something called the JSI, which is the JavaScript interface. And you have something called the Fabric, which is the new uh, render in React that supports uh, React 18. And you have uh, Turbo Modules. And all of these new concepts here now are written in C++, which means that you can take those out and you can basically put it anywhere which uh, runs C++ and you get the, uh, the benefits of React Native out of the box. And now Yoga is also written in C++, so all the benefits of the new, uh, all the benefits that's been done on Android and iOS, it's now by default uh, available for, uh, for, for everyone. And since this is written in C++, the communication between the JavaScript side and the native side is now also synchronously. So now you can have uh, a priority queue. React can tell what the native side should optimize, and you can also lazy load native modules. Well, one of the benefits of React Native is <laughs> one of its disadvantages, that it's actually native. Because as a React Native developer, you need to know 
JavaScript or TypeScript, but as well as Objective-C, Kotlin, Java, or Swift. And, or, and you could be also exposed to different builds uh, tools for, for the different platforms like Gradle, CocoaPods, and Fastlane. And there are tools in React Native to try to abstract away all of this for you, so you only have to care about uh, uh, the JavaScript side. Personally, I, don't, I think you should understand the platform you're working on to try to optimize for it. Uh, but now, since they also have introduced a new layer, which is C++, which means that you also have to learn C++. But uh, here's uh, wh where the React Native team has uh, created a new concept, which is called CodeGen. Stands for Code Generator. <laughs> and what it basically does is that uh, it, it, you can create um, interfaces in Flow or TypeScript, and it will automatically generate the, uh, the C++ files based on that. So uh, you uh, can, can create uh, native modules yourself, and uh, the interface here is uh, created by default with, uh, with the code gen. And the code gen then also makes it possible that uh, you get type safety all the way from the JavaScript side to the UI thread. Does that make sense as well? Nice. So uh, let's try to showcase a little of uh, a little of this. So I'll start with uh, some animation, uh, a package called Reanimated and React Native Gesture Handler, which is created by a company called Software uh, Mansion. So um, so uh, here we have. Uh, a box, and if I click on it, you can see that it interpolates colors uh, quite nice. And I can uh, drag it around, and you can see that the UI thread shows that it's it runs on 60 FPS. Even this is also in debug mode. And the same for uh, uh, for Android. I can also press on it, and it uh, animates with uh, 60 FPS. And uh, I'm going to try to, this is a bit of a strange example, but I'm going to try to uh, showcase this either way. So we have this counter here. And I've created a very dumb function in JavaScript that takes a number as an argument, and it tries to increment by one until it hits that number. The, the reason for this is that I would like to block the JavaScript thread to try to showcase what happens with uh, the React Native app when you block the JavaScript thread. So if I start this, you can see that if I try to click this button, nothing happens. And uh, this is the same behavior as on the web, that the event is cached, uh, it's cached and put on the stack. And when uh, the, heavy, the heavy calculation is finished, it takes the, the stack and it runs the code that uh, s stays there. And you can see here on, on Android as well, try to click the button, nothing happens. But what do you think happens if I try to run this heavy calculation and run the animations as well? Any takers? Okay. Okay. So let's see if I start the animation. You can see everything works perfectly. Even I can't press this button, but the animation works perfectly. And the reason for this is uh, uh, the new architecture that uh, you declare all your animation and gesture handlers declaratively upfront. So when that code gets mounted, it gets chance it gets moved from the JavaScript to the native side of the platform, and it it lives there. So it, with this uh, with this, you basically get two threads out of the box. You get the UI thread and the JavaScript thread. And uh, when you create native applications, all the animation there runs on the UI thread as well. So it uh, executes the animation on the exact same thread as you do when you create uh, native applications. So you can see here as well, I can still do the same on, uh, on Android. And if I uh, start the calculation and click the animate button, nothing happens because the animate button is on the JavaScript side, and as soon as uh, the heavy calculation is finished, then it starts animation. But if I start animation and start the calculation, it runs, because then it's already started executing on the UI thread. Does that make sense? 
Nice. And uh, I think I'm going to try to showcase this as well. So um, you have this hot uh, reloading in in React as well that uh, keeps the state. So I'm just going to, so if I change the background color here as well to, you can see that it keeps the state of the of the increment, which is uh, makes it quite easy and rapid to 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 develop with uh, with React Native. Uh, the next example is some 2D graphics, and this is done with a package called React Native uh, Skia, which is sponsored by uh, Shopify. Some of you might have heard of Skia before; it's the UI renderer for uh, Google that Chrome uses and Flutter, for instance. And it's also reporting to to uh, to React Native. So um, I haven't written the code I'm going to show you now. I've taken it from the example package uh, in Skia because uh, it's quite uh, complex. But uh, I think this the the goal of to show you this is just to make sure that you understand that you can create a lot of uh, complex 2D graphics with React Native without compromising on on, uh, on quality. And you have the Philips uh, view where you can interpolate uh, colors, matrix, matrix here as well, and uh, you have uh, a way to interpolate uh, graphs, and when you drag it, you see that the header interpolates as well. So. I at least think this is uh, really cool, and it shows shows that you can write code once, and it runs on uh, with high performance on both Android and iOS. Any questions, or does it make sense? Nice. So uh, the next thing I'm gonna uh, talk about is uh, also part of the React Native ecosystem, which is something called code push or over the air updates. So if you remember when we talked about the new architecture or the architecture in general in React Native, we have a JavaScript bundle. And that's essentially the same as when you go to any web page and uh, that get executed, there is most certainly a JavaScript bundle there, there that get that executed. And the same thing is true for, uh, for React Native. So when you open an Android and iOS app, uh, the native code gets uh, executed, and then at some point it loads the JavaScript bundle into memory, and that gets executed. But there is no reason that the JavaScript bundle needs to be in memory. It can also live on a server somewhere. So what uh, code push or over air updates really is, is that you can ship your JavaScript bundle to a server somewhere, and each time your clients open the app, they will always get the latest version of your app. And I think this really shows that when you take uh, mobile developers and uh, web developers and try to combine a framework to make it better, they take what's good from both places and try to uh, apply them to, uh, uh, to, to React Native. And this basically means that if you have uh, a critical bug, you can deploy it right away instead of waiting for a review from Apple and, and Google. And basically with this, you can also bypass the release cycle on Google and Android. I wouldn't recommend that because if you never release through Apple and Google, they will think your app is abandoned and it's very bad for App Store optimization and search keywords. But uh, it's, uh, it's a nice tool to have and I think this is one of the, the key benefits of, uh, of React Native. So uh, now we talked a lot about uh, React Native and how you can do animations and how it works under the hood. And uh, I want to uh, also show another use case of React Native, how you can integrate React Native to, uh, with uh, s uh, a native code. So um, a couple of years ago, uh, I started working on a project uh, which is basically a workout DJ that plays podcast when you uh, go slow on in the gym or when you're running and when you uh, lift or you start running fast, it plays music. So I'm going to try to showcase 
this now. So uh, here's the app, and what it basically does, it has a timer, and as soon as the timer uh, runs down, it will automatically switch between podcast and music. So now it listens to Tim Ferriss, and the timer goes down, it starts playing uh, music instead, and you can toggle it back and forth. And let's see, you can also press your headphones to toggle back and forth uh, between, uh, between the music and, and podcast. So uh, when we started working on this project, uh, we were quite uh, naive. So I will try to show you uh, a flow of how we implemented the shifting functionality. So uh, let's take the use case of uh, the headphones. And the headphones are connected to your phone via Bluetooth. So when uh, someone presses on the headphones, that's, that event gets taken on the native side, and it has to go to the JavaScript side and say, hey, uh, I just got a headphone event, do whatever you have to do. And then let's say that uh, we are playing podcast, and that means that the JavaScript side has to pause the podcast. But all the audio is done on the native side, so the JavaScript has to go to the native side and pause the podcast. And then when that's done, the native side tells the JavaScript side again, yep, I've done, uh, I've paused it. Now let's uh, play some music. And then the JavaScript side want to play music, goes to the native side again, and it starts playing music. And when that's done, it goes back to the JavaScript side and the JavaScript side update uh, the UI. And as you can see here, there's quite a, a lot of redundant steps that uh, goes back and forth here. So essentially what uh, we did was that we removed all of the things on the JavaScript side and we implemented everything on uh, the native side. So everything that is related to shifting, like uh, the duration, uh, the timers, the circular uh, countdown here, all of that are on the native side on each platform. So the downside of that is that we have to write the code twice, but the positive is that it's way more performant. And I think this also shows that it's quite easy to, to, to integrate native code with uh, React Native, and it also shows that you can start with React Native, and if you see some limitations, you can go and fix them on the native side. So 95% of this application is in React Native, but it's only this uh, that we moved to uh, the native side. And this is how the code looks like in, uh, in React Native. In, so by default, React Native exposes, when you create views in uh, the native side on iOS, uh, Android and iOS, those are exposed out by React Native, so you can use them as, as React Native components in your code. And the props you pass down, those props get passed to the native side and you can get those, uh, those properties there and uh, do logic on them. Any questions? Cool. So uh, I'm gonna finish off, talk a bit about uh, React Native Web. So React Native Web was, I think, was started in 2017 by a guy called Niklas that works at Twitter. So, he started looking into React Native and talked to the meta developers about the, uh, the problem they had and what they were initially trying to solve with React Native. And he saw that a lot of the problems they were trying to solve with React Native they had at Twitter. So he wanted to try to port React Native to the web to see if they could uh, solve some of the problems uh, they had. So as far as I know today, Twitter.com runs on React Native web. Uber dot com runs on uh, React Native Web, and I think this is the most growing part of the React Native community that uh, most of the third-party packages that are out there, at least the ones that's popular, also supports web out of the box. And uh, we've been using React Native Web for a year in, in, in production at Kron, and when I first initially heard about React Native. I didn't really believe in it because <laughs> you're probably also aware of all of these platforms that says that you can write code once and run anywhere. And essentially what happens is that you get a complex use case and you have to work your way around the framework instead of actually helping you. 
So what we did was that we took the complex part of our mobile app, copy pasted it into uh, a web app, and we installed React Native Web, and it just worked out of the box. It was uh, quite uh, quite amazing. So at Krona we have a mono repo where we have defined all our screens in one place, and those screens are imported into uh, our web app and our mobile app. So what you see here and here and here are all running the same code. And for instance, on the web here, you see that we have a download button, but on uh, Android and iOS, we have uh, uh, an arrow. And you can easily do this by checking which platform it's, uh, it's running on. And at least what I think is super cool, like everything here is uh, DOM elements, and everything here is uh, Android elements, and everything here is iOS elements, so you get uh, all the good things from the platform, but you only have to write the code uh, once. And what this enables for us is that we are a very small team that are uh, in charge of everything that's user-facing in, in Kron, and we are able to move very fast. So uh, I think that's all I had, actually. So uh, thank you. <laughs>